All right. So when we left off, the last thing I showed you was that skull from Jericho with the plaster, the kind of disheveled head, had the category numbers written up on the side. I wanted to, I, you know, it was kind of a good place to stop because, because of this, it kind of put Jericho in that first chapter because in a lot of ways it's the end of prehistory. And that is that uh, Jericho exists. It still exists today. And in fact, it's considered to be by many scholars, the oldest continually inhabited city in the world goes back 8,000 years. But for the early part, we, we, don't, we don't know much about it. And so it's still kind of prehistory, but it's a radical change. As you guys that looked at the book and saw the end of chapter one, they show some pictures of Jericho and Jericho is a city, been a city for a long time. That's a marked difference from what we've seen with the cave art, with the stone figurines, with all of the other art that we saw in the chapter. That was truly prehistory. This is kind of the beginning of life in cities. And so where do you put it? Where do you draw the line? So today we'll be talking about some of the ancient cities in the Western world. And it all comes down to a place called Mesopotamia. And uh, I think what I might do is leave this screen up. We'll get to it in a minute. I got this on my Apple News because they always send me stuff because I always look for stuff like this. This time I had to subscribe. But it looked good enough that I should probably do that. So anyway, we'll talk about this in a minute. I think what, where we want to go start off with is here. Mesopotamia. And a slideshow from the beginning. And that is modern day Iraq and Iran. Ancient Mesopotamia. What does it mean? You know what meso means? It's kind of it's out of the Latin. Sounds like soup to me. Yeah, there you go. Hey, we got it. I couldn't say that. But it was good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it could be so. Bottom line, it means middle. And you ever hear the term like Mesoamerica? That refers to like Nicaragua, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, you know, in between the two continents. It's in the middle. And so Mesopotamia is here. And it's really this area right here. That's Mesopotamia. And they put Persia on this map too, which is what is to the east of Mesopotamia. Iraq, Iran, you can see the modern day borders. And in this, I wanna kind of uh, give you a little bit of an idea. What we have here is this lower part in the south, and it says Sumer. And if you ever hear the term Sumerian, that means it's from this southern part of Iraq. And then you've got the Akkadian or Akkadian societies right here in the middle. And this includes the ancient city of Babylon. And 
hopefully you'll understand, hopefully you'll recognize that in the Quran, in the Bible, in Jewish tradition, that Babylon is like huge. It's like one of the great uh, cities of the ancient world. And so anyway, we got historical records. Along with cities, we have historical records about what they did and, and who they were. And on the northern part of this Mesopotamia is Assyria. And if you ever hear Assyrian, Acacian, Sumerian, that's all civilizations in Mesopotamia. And over here, we have a few places there were simultaneously cultures arising in what is modern day Iraq, or excuse me, modern day Iran. And we call this area by and large Persia. And if you've ever heard of like Persian rugs, the Persian Gulf, that's what this is. It's still called that. And Medea. That's the northern part of Iran. But basically, I, all of the Iranians, you know, any Iranian people here? Well, I all of my people that I've ever met from Iran, being Iranian or being Persian, it's like interchangeable. Are you from the United States or are you an American? Kind of. And so anyway, that's where this is. And these are the early cultures. And so work of base, offerings to Inanna, goddess, uh, the Inanna Temple Complex, Uruk, modern day Warka which is where we got i forgot that Uruk, right here southern part sumerian and so look this thing is like this thing is like really kind of cool and a lot of textbooks start with this one object and partly because it's so cool, part of it is that it's so old, and part of it is that it is in really pretty good shape. You see, it's like three feet high. So, you know, it's about this tall. And it's heavy. It's like, it's like, it's like made out of alabaster. Anybody know what alabaster is? Uh, part of it, don't know that. No, we were talking about stone in here last time. And on, on the Mohs scale, alabaster is really pretty soft. It's a white mineral. Uh, and it is relatively easy to carve. And it's white, typically. And it's the kind of mineral that you find a lot in desert environments. So you go to Southwest United States, you can find alabaster out here too. So look, I, I'm going to zoom in on some of it here. This is quite a jump from what we saw just last Wednesday, I think. I hope you can see that too. What they're doing on this base is that they're telling a story and it is offered offerings to Inanna. And you can see what's going on here. The wine glass, the chalice, you see the animals, it's like, here are the servants bringing, bringing the food and drink to the banquet. I got wine, and you see the other thing is too embarrassing. They're naked, you say it. But 
And then you go down here, and this is kind of, uh, this is where all of the goods come from. The farmers, the uh, livestock. See, down here you got the grain, here you got the livestock. Then they make it into food and drink, and then it's offered up as meal. Presentation of offering to Panana. Another thing that's real cool about this, this is telling a story. This is basically where we get what will last for thousands of years, the convention for telling stories with still pictures or images. Today, we can tell stories all kinds of ways, but in this time, in this place, well, you know, they may have had paper, we don't know, but it was typically etched, carved into stone. They were here that uh, there's a lot of old sayings that revolve around this. It's not written in stone, means that it's not permanent. If something is written in stone, that means it's here now, it'll be here forever to say it. But that is part of it. It's it's carved in stone, and it's told from bottom to top, and it tells a story about the offerings given to the goddess Inanna. Whoa, they're telling a story. Nothing that we've seen to this point actually tells a story. And I said it was a convention. What is a convention, you might ask? Or I'll ask you, what is a convention? A meeting? It is. There's another definition, though. That's why I'm teasing this out a little bit. Yeah, convention is a, a gathering of people. Yeah, and you guys being young professionals, you'll probably go to conventions sometimes, you know. Or if you're like really kind of uh, into popular culture, you might go to a Harry Potter convention. Or if you're old like me, you might go to a Star Trek convention or something. Those are conventions and you're absolutely right. But in art, when we talk about this, it is really a standard way of doing things. And so that becomes a convention. Have you ever heard of the term conventional? That means it's standard. It's, it's the norm. It is, it is how we do things. It is the standard. And so that's what's happening here. This idea of putting bands, in, in this case, around a, a circular cylindrical object, you put it around and it goes one way, then it goes this way, then it goes that way. You know, this is all what they invented. And telling a story, this is how they did it. It became the convention. And we'll see this kind of storytelling in Egypt and other cultures where you kind of know how to read it. And in this case, it's left to right, right to left, and left to right. The same. Other conventions. Can you guys think of any kind of conventional formats or visual information? Our point, yeah. Yeah, that, that has, that's a good answer. That's really conventional because like I did still with PowerPoint, but it's, oh, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Why don't you get with it? Everybody gets it. You put the images in a sequence and this, and you go, pop, 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 pop. how about graphic novels? And that's just a whole bunch of blocks on a page with different pictures. 
but you know how to read them because you know the conventions of graphic novels and you look at the pictures and you follow the plot. You know how to do that. How about another convention? How about this as a convention? That's, that's a talk balloon. That is a convention. That doesn't really what talking looks like, but we understand that. And similarly, if you do what balloon? I know it's kind of funny. But anyway, thought balloon. Those are conventions. And in visual arts, this is like one of the earliest conventions for storytelling. And that is, at least in part, what makes it so unique and so interesting. So the Wonka base and in Iraq, the southern part of modern day Iran. This is the White Temple, and it's really all that's, that's left of it. Uh, time, climate, weather, wars, all kinds of things. But we know this is a temple. There's enough of it left in there that we know what it is. And, it, and we think that this is what it looked like originally. And that's another thing that, that happens in art history is that they get a lot of people from various disciplines in the sciences and in the arts and engineering and stuff. And they kind of come up with this stuff based on, based on what's there. And so how this is what they think it looks like. And, and so anyway, Bottom line, it's another uh, example from uh, Waka in Uruk, Uruk, Uruk. Anyway, there's another thing that, that starts to happen here too. And you can see this was all pretty early, 3300 BCE. Um, they start to to people and in a way that we don't see like personality and stuff. You see all of the figures that we've seen in the cave paintings and a lot of times those, those figures don't really have faces. And in fact, the animals seem to have uh, greater detail. But we start to see figures that almost look like you could know who this person is. But there's one kind of characteristic that happens all over Mesopotamia, and that is this. Zoom in. Big eyes. Big eyes and braided hair and braided beards. And this is, this too is conventional Mesopotam ancient Mesopotamian art. And so it says statuettes of two worshipers. And you see there, the man is two feet four, the woman one foot 11. And you can see there's, that's what they are. They, we believe they are worshipers and they were statuettes that would have been in the temple. But like the big eyes. You guys have any idea what people have made of the big eyes? Part of the beautiful. Beautiful? Yes, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I could go with that. See, beauty. Yeah, that is. That is a thing. That is on the list of criteria for what is art, and most people, not everybody, but most people see beauty. 
as a requisite. Can I tell you about ancient alien theorist? Oh, yeah. Well, they say that this is proof that that aliens came down and interbred with human beings because you know the the grays the aliens have big eyes i think that we could dismiss that the prevailing theory is that the big eyes represent a heightened awareness that we kind of, in this day and age, how shall we say this? Using some terms from right out of the news, and I know it's a little controversial when people use it in a lot of ways, but these people are woke. They are aware. Their eyes are wide open. They see it. They get it. They are true believers. And that's what we think is behind the big eyes. And so I put the, I put a star by that one and a work of base. Uh, so these are some of the most significant and popular unseated statuette, Temple of Ishtar at Mari, Syria. So we're going a little bit farther out to the west of Mesopotamia, but hey, you can tell that's Mesopotamian, so you don't have to see much more. Big eyes. And again, you know, usually the figures do look like they could be actual people, which is kind of another level. One of the greatest, most significant artifacts uh, from southern Mesopotamia is this, and it was retrieved from a tomb. And one of the, I'll give you a little preview here. A lot of things that happen in Mesopotamia will happen in Egypt. And so, like the Egyptians, they buried their important people in tombs and put objects in the tomb, which points to the idea that they believed in an afterlife, as the Egyptians do. And so this was something that the tomb of Huabi, that Huabi could have in the next slide. But this is really kind of a magnificent example. And you see, it's almost 3,000 years old. It's a bullheaded harp. And you can play music on this. It, it's really, it's functional. And it has this inlay. Uh, and it's wood, lapis lazuli. Anybody know what lapis lazuli is? Uh, yeah. yeah. It is. It's a it's considered today to be a semi-precious stone. It's uh it's kind of like turquoise or something along those lines. It's a rock, it's deep blue, and this shows another level of sophistication. We just went from what were outstanding examples of cave painting and ancient sculpture, but look at this. It's, and it's got, it's with gold and seashell and lapis lazuli, lapis lazuli. Uh, by the way, lapis lazuli was used for a long time in paint. That was the pigment for new oil paint and blue egg tank, just say. But look at this. We got 
We talked about this a little bit last time, these anthropomorphic animals, animals with human heads, human features. This continues on. We'll see this in Egypt. We'll see this for a long time. Um, but here is some of the origins. We saw the ivory carving of a man with a lion's head last week. We got people with the head of a bull and these animals doing human things. And this guy here, probably a scorpion man. So I want to ask you this. I was talking about graphic novels just a moment ago. Do we still do these things, uh, characters? Creatures that are half human and half something else. I see a lot of heads shaking. Like what? Like Spider Man, for example? I'm just saying, you know. I mean, if, you know, one of the things about graphic novels, if you guys are into them, I know maybe some of you are, there is so much from that culture that comes right out of ancient Western civilization. You'll see a lot of stuff that comes out of Mesopotamia, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, and so on. Uh, and so those things that, you know, how should I say, they go on, but they have their roots. And it's almost as long as people have been making making art. And so this is really kind of interesting. This is the sound box, which it kind of is yet another level of sophistication, too. Because a hollow box will amplify sound. You ever see an acoustic guitar or a ukulele? why that you have that box, which is essentially what it is. It's kind of a figure eight shape, but it it amplifies, it's it's acoustics. It's, uh, you know, it's guitars and it's ukuleles and violins. So all string instruments have a sound box of one shape or another. Over the years, it becomes more sophisticated and, the type of wood and the shape will change, but it all comes back to this. This is the amp. Incredible. Oh, and something else I wanted to show you here. I want to bring this to your attention. British Museum, London. Mesopotamian. Englishman. Why is this in London? Because Londoners like that ancient harp sound. It's like the Beatles and stuff. Now, yes. Colonization. Colonization. Correct, absolutely. And bottom line is that uh, what we have here is, is this colonization and what happens after, right after World War One. Uh, if you know the story about Lawrence of Arabia and all of that, but basically after World War One, Europeans kind of divided up the Middle East, colonized it basically. And we'll find that with Egypt, too. And usually when the invaders or the colonial powers came in, a lot of times they took, sometimes they took everything that wasn't nailed down. And so you find in a lot of museums, even American museums, because what happens in the 20th century is that there's a resurgence on archaeology that becomes a great interest 
in the West and around the world, but but American archaeologists, when they find something, they put it on the boat, send it back to New York. And likewise, the Brits, the French, you'll find all kinds of stuff from all over the world in the British Museum. So yeah, colonization. And there's a other side to that story. Repatriation, that's a word, you'll see it a lot. Repatriation, a lot of places around the world, and it's contentious in a lot of places. Egypt, especially. Um, all over the world Greece they want they want their they want their ancient marble statue better. and so that that whole issue is called repatriation and a lot of this is being litigated as we speak in the courts around the world and it's part of international diplomacy but anyway and this one, this was actually discovered by a British Army. So, you know, uh, banquet scene, great. We've talked about this already. The freeze, the register, that's what you call that, this line, this storyline. And this is a cylinder seal. And this is kind of flat. Now, that's what it looks like. And this is what it looks like if you would take it apart and flatten it out. A cylinder seal. What the heck? Any of you guys mechanics? Oh, um, they have a four cylinder, six cylinder. Has nothing to do with the same. Cylinder is just basically uh, around cylindrical length object. And that's what this is over here. It's something that this is the original thing. And this is the impression. And what this was for, as we now know, you put wax on an official document or, or something that needed some kind of authentication. And so this is your like your user ID, password, all in one thing. We'll put a put wax down and roll this thing over the hot wax. And this is what you do. And this would mean that it was an official. So like an, so like a seal sort of thing. Absolutely. That's where it comes from. Right out of ancient Mesopotamia. And another great lapis lazuli shell, red limestone, bitumen. Bitumen's like a real hard rock. Uh, it's what is the shape of this. Uh, bottom line, 2,700 years ago, roughly. And called a standard of Ur, and this was found by a British archaeologist too, and they call it the standard of Ur, it may be one of the misnomers, as there are a lot of them, because these archaeologists were discovering these works, and after research, kind of the meaning and the purpose of these objects kind of change the more you know. But it's called the standard of Ur because the, the, because the guy who found this thing thought this was used like a flag. You ever heard of a flag being referred to as a standard? Yeah. We still use it. A lot of these, these terms I'm to tossing out here are kind of archaic, but that's what they thought this was. They thought this was some 
something that they would hold up and say, we are from Ur, you know, like you would have a battle flag with uh, stars and stripes on it, Mount Suribachi or something, you know, that's what they thought. Bottom line is that we don't know what it was for, but it's kind of interesting. It had it has the freezes, the the register. We see the story being told, and this whole thing goes from left to right, left to the center over here, and left here. So, knowing what we know. We say this is the war side. What that's what this depicts. Warfare. Ancient warfare. Superpower. And so these guys, well, look at this. They have horse-drawn chariots. That's kind of sophisticated. That animals that we were seeing in the caves painted as prehistoric horses. These, these, these horses are a little different. And we see when they have the spears uh, and they have the, the weaponry uh, at, of the ancient army. But here we go. Uh, we got the charioteers and we got the, this would be the infantry right here. And what we have here, whoa, I'm gonna zoom in on this, get a better look at this. Who, who are these guys? Arnold, strangers. Yeah, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. These are the vanquished. These are the guys who got captured. Enemy soldiers. Seeing they don't even have any clothes on. They just took all of their stuff. They're ashamed. They're begging for forgiveness. Just saying. And up here, we have a, the official royal chariot. We have advisors and so on, and some of what you might call generals or the officers, and who would this guy be? The king? You say no. Okay, I can go with that. He is the leader. Uh, I I would call him the king because oftentimes, in ancient times anyway, the kings often led their armies. For instance, like a Julius Caesar or something. So, but in either case, you're right on the money. It is the leader and. There are a couple of visual signals that tell you that this is the leader. What would that be? Oh, yes. Oh, I thought you were giving me an answer. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yes, size, scale is important in in this kind of artwork. And that'll maintain itself for a long time. A lot of the things that I'm picking out here, it's gonna be very useful in being able to decipher the rest of the other cultures we're talking about. They all kind of stem from this, but he's, he's larger. It's the scale of importance and... I'm sorry, could you... Well, you're right on. You know, the other part of it is, it's it's the scale and he's top dead center. 
He's in the center and it's above everybody else. We'll see this persist. We'll start talking about at some point later in this course, Christian art. And you'll have like a big depiction of Jesus and then a bunch of little figures all around because it is the scale that determines the importance and the position. And in this case, it's top dead center, but the center is always the important. And so the other side of this is the peace side. And it's basically like the work of Ace. And here we go, and here are the important wealthy people. They're all enjoying the benefits of the culture. They're eating and drinking, and they got music playing over here. Yeah, that's how you roll. This is party time. This is the wealthy, and they got the servants. They have, they have everything. And so here we go. Um, these are the people that end up doing their professionals, their cooks, the attendants, the butlers, and so on. You see, they basically have the prize animals here. And presumably for slaughter. And then down on the bottom, you have the workers, the people who work the fields. Order of importance. Top, middle, lower importance, standard of birth. And so one of the other things, and it, you kind of would know this already, I think. One of the subjects in Mesopotamian art that comes out a lot, battle scenes. They always like to show that they are victorious. That's Basically, what this is, this is after the battle, we are strong, we are powerful, don't mess with us. And so that's what, uh, what this is. Uh, Stella, S-T-E-L-E. -E. Another vocabulary word out of the ancient world. Stella. Just means that it's a rock that has, that's been carved that tell, gives you some information. And so this is how they did it back then, back in the, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. We still use Stella's. It's still actually kind of an important part of our culture. Anybody got a Stella they want to throw out there? How about gravestones? They are Stella, and it comes out of this, out of this tradition. Not everybody around the world does, does cemeteries and burials like we do here in the U.S. or in the Western world, but we put that stone. And it's a Stella, and it has the information. Here lies John Bohag, lived to be 150 years old. So I got enough time left. Rest in peace. It's just saying. And so that's a Stella, and it does commemorate uh, victory ahead of an Akkadian ruler. And this is from the Temple of Ishtar in Nina. Nineveh, Nineveh, I went to the pronunciation guide, Nina, Nineveh is how you say it, Nineveh. And so anyway, but what did I, what have we been talking about, about the characteristics? Braided beards actually have facial features that kind of look naturalistic, like you might be able to recognize this person. And thirdly, big eyes, not quite as big as what we've seen, but we think that this probably had seashells. They used shells a lot for us. Uh, Victory Stella, Naram Sin. 
Here it is, the victory stellar. And you know who this is? He's the victor. He is the ruler. He is the important person. And you see everybody else either vanquished or in some kind of adoration sort of pose. And in this case, this is kind of an interesting thing. We think this is the sun, but there's two suns. So a lot of mystery in this old stuff. But uh, from Ur, devoted disc, ziggurat, this is Ur. It's all still southern Mesopotamia, but we're going to move here um, to the the northern part. Uh, and this is Gudia, seated. Uh, um, zoom in on this too, because what is going to put in here? Say Nineveh, the Syrian. And you can see, we have hieroglyphics here. Look at that. This is writing. And so we really are in the age of history. And a lot of rulers, a lot of cultures in Mesopotamia developed their own writing. So we have people that have, in fact, translated this. That they can read what the ancient people try to tell us. Gudea stare, standing, more writing. And you see, it's like hieroglyphs. What we see in uh, some of the ancient cultures like Samaria, we see a kind of writing that's a little bit different. It's, uh, I'll show you here. And we finally, we get some, not too many, examples of painting from this ancient culture. You can see here, uh, it's just, it's almost destroyed, but there was enough there. That they could haul it back to the Louvre in Paris. And again, when I talk about the ancient world, figures, we don't know exactly what that is, but that looks like it probably had a human head. We got a, a probably a lion here with wings and so on. Queen of the Night from Babylon. Painted terracotta. What is terracotta? I think we talked about it. It's clay. So this is kind of an interesting depiction. And you can see she is half bird, half human. See her talons, her feet, her wings. But this looks as though, and we'll talk about ancient India, this actually has bears some resemblance to sculpture we find in India from the time. Don't know if there was a connection. We do know that there was travel and trade routes. The culture developed. We start to see interactions. And the other part of it that I have to add is that we talk about these as being Assyrian or Acacian or Sumerian, but bottom line, mostly civilization in this part of the world was really a city state. The city was everything. I said, like this kind of geography that we see today. And so here we go, Stella with the coat of Hammurabi. And so it's not detailed enough that 
I can pick up the writing for you, but I can't read it anyway. And have you ever heard Code of Hammurabi? What is it? It is. It is a set of laws. The laws, it actually a lot of people talk quite convincingly that this Code of Hammurabi is really sort of the basis of modern day laws. Because as far as we know, it's the first time everything was written down. And it has these little things like it. It seems pretty severe, but if you steal a loaf of bread, you get your hand chopped off. Ow. Yeah, it's pretty severe. But there, but it tells you what the offenses are, the things that are both illegal and what the punishment is. And so we still kind of follow that model in our own way, but that's how the criminal code is set up. Murder one, either life imprisonment or the death penalty. But you know what the charge is, you know what the crime is, you know what the penalty is. And that's how this is written. It's, it's really quite amazing. Uh, Lion's Gate in modern day Turkey. Uh, you can see some of the architecture, what, what's left. Uh, let me see. Um, oh, I'm just going to see some here. I was going to back up, back up, back up, back up, back, back. There it is. This is kind of a phenomenon that a lot of statues and other artwork, but mostly sculpture, because that was kind of the main art form. We find the statues and they're headless. Show you that one. See this one? What up with that? Well, you could say uh, that she lost her head. <laughs> Literally. Well, we see a lot. And it's just not here, but it's through time. And one of the things that when people want to deface art, and that's kind of its own cottage industry. It's been happening through time. And a lot of times it's for political purposes. This guy is not our king anymore. Boom. And it almost, almost invariably goes right to the head and face. Knocking off the head, you know. Uh, the Sphinx, we'll see that in Egypt, got the face blown off of it, cannon fire. It's when you want to deface something, that is actually where we get that word, defacing something. And it seems like we do that, or we collectively human beings, that's been happening over the centuries. And so it's not surprising to find these, these statues. And so this is the Citadel of Sargon II. And um, and so, you know, these cities are starting to become very sophisticated. Lam Asu, oh man, wings. This is from the Citadel. Look at this. We've been talking about these ideas here. It's a bull. It's got wings. It's got a. It's got the king's head or the protector. It's got 
I always thought this was kind of an interesting solution to a problem. And that problem is, is if you're going to make something this big and this heavy, and you wanted to put four legs on it, how would you do that? Two things. One, you'd leave the open space here, leave that stone intact. Because if these legs were the sole support, Oh, crash in the other thing is that if you look at the other side it has two legs there so if you went around it and counted it would be a six-legged animal anyway some of the other characteristics ancient mesopotamia the braided beard big eye. Louvre, Paris. And so I want to kind of get to uh, these Assyrian kings, uh, Asher Nasirpal and Asher Banapal. And so both of these, these guys. Similar carvings, and they got, but and you can see, you can tell what kind of technology they had too. We talked about chariots; they have bows and arrows too. I wanted to show you Asher Bonapal hunting lions, and here he is. You know, it's him. He's the biggest. He's central. He's got got the headgear. Got everything. This is really kind of interesting artwork. I'll show you some more here. This is another part of that frieze. And here's what it looks like at the Royal Museum in London, the British Museum. And so you can see this is like I would been saying about telling a story and so anyway we got him and if you wanted to make yourself known as being strong powerful what would you do if you wanted to depict yourself to show yourself hunting the lions that's one of the most dangerous enterprises one could engage in and that's always had this kind of macho thing and big game hunting and stuff like that. But this was, you know, almost 4,000 years ago. Ashurbanipal hunting lions. And it was really kind of cool to see this. You see the dead lion here because you see the arrows. And here's another one. Asher, he's not afraid. He's got his bow drawn and boom. Brave. Fierce. Powerful. I always liked these guys here in this part of the freeze. Do you know what they're doing? Yeah, well, yeah, that could that that's a good answer. Uh, I think what they're doing though is something else. I think those are symbols, symbols that make noise, percussion, instrument, and that's what you do. Because when you're hunting lions or, or a lot of other big game, the animals aren't stupid. They'll hide in the brush. And the way you get them out is with loud noises. They don't recognize. They get scared when they come out. And that's what these guys are doing. They're chasing the lion towards 
Asher Bono. And so anyway, but look at these horses. I mean, it's, a lot of the carving on these is just magnificent. Uh, and you can see all the decorations and things. Here's a wounded lion that's on that same phrase I just showed you at the British Museum. You see these? I want to tell you something about the lion. Now, a lot of people, and Carter, you talked about the beauty. Yes. And that is, that is always an issue. And a lot of what hopefully we do when we see art from today or three or four, 20,000 years ago, is that we appreciate it for its beauty. And there's been a lot of written about it, these uh these carvings and the just the sheer beauty, even though this is a, a wounded lion, you can see, you can see the agony on its face. You can see, you can see the power of this lion. You can see the lines, graceful lines as is the case when you're talking about big cats and large animals. And so this is a beautiful lion. You can see the blood flowing here. I mean, a lot of ways this is. It's a horrible subject, kind of a beautiful part. And there have been some other things that we get from a lot of these ancient works of art. Kind of talked about that a little bit with cave art, pregnant horse with the short legs, talking about the evolution of horses and how they change due to breeding. This is an Asiatic lion. This was hunted in a part of the world that doesn't have lions anymore. And so this is kind of a kind of a biological botany sort of thing. But at any rate, there he is. And here is a statue of Azure Bonapal. You see he's got the lion's head right there. You see he's got some He's got a lion's claw in his hand. And this was the guy. And so, Asher Bonapal, I want to go back here and share this with you. This is from National Geographic. This was what I was fooling around with when you guys came in. And National Geographic is one of the regular kind of magazines. It's kind of open that you can get rather open. Stuff. Not considered this to be a scholarly journal, but the information, the stories are based on ongoing research. And there are a number of magazines of this type, History Magazine, and a few others that are basically for everyday consumers. There's another set of publications that are called peer-reviewed sources. You know what peer-reviewed is? Okay, Carter, you're on a roll. I'm going with you. I think it's like you from your like classmates that is that's, that's how we use that here that's yeah you got the idea and oh dear i forgot your name already you hit yes you Evelyn. Evelyn, um, yes being yeah so, 
So you guys are both yeah, on the right track. When we talk about peer-reviewed sources, uh, that, though, that as it applies to scholarly writing, means that the peers are not classmates, they are other scholars in the field. And so that's what happens when you get in higher ed, you become a professor or a researcher or an archeologist or something, you write about your subject and you subject your write, I mean, your writings to your peers in the field. So that's what peer review means. It's just done at a different level, but we use peer review in the very same way. When your classmates take a look at your own work and that's right to the point. But when we talk about peer review, that'll be, and I'm going to show you guys this sometime pretty soon. I'll show you what that means because it's a library uh, search function, peer review. I'll show you that. But at any rate, this, these kind of magazines are basically the latest news in the world of archaeology, of science. There's all kinds of things that uh, National Geographic reports on. And I saw this one pop up. It's brand new. Asher Bonapal's military prowess was unquestionable as his Assyrian Empire conquered lands from Egypt to Mesopotamia. But the mighty king crowed the loudest about his great royal library, the world's biggest in 7th century BC. And here's a mini bot. This is what we're just talking about, this particular work. And so uh, this, I zoom in. Oh, it's copyrights. Yeah. Anyway, this is a tablet. Uh, a fragment from the Gilgamesh tablet, and it's uh, the part that talks about the Great Flood, which is very similar to the Noah's Ark story. There are parallels. And so anyway, but this is all stuff that uh, Mimiva, we were talking about that, Babylon, so on. And so anyway, this is just uh, what they've been finding, what they've been finding lately. And so I can't, ah, I wish I could zoom in, but I put this link on the module. And if you're interested to take a look at it, I'm good with that. Uh, I had a lot of trouble with it because I just did subscribe this is something for subscribers only. I'm kind of cheating them a little bit by sharing it with you, but that's okay. Yeah, we got Wednesday, right? Right. Um, I'm not going to ask on it. what to expect. Now, seriously, what I'm going to do, what it's going to be, what I'm going to do is talk about that on Wednesday, and what it's going to be is a take-home assignment. So I really don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if I explain it right when I get you with it, boom, hopefully and so um, and I'll give you guys plenty of time to finish this and for if you guys have get extra time from your uh, accommodations I'll even build that in I'll have like a due date in another couple of days later yeah, you need if you get extra time, you need to get another cup.
But yeah, I want to make sure that you fully get it. And that is part of why I wanted to talk to you about National Geographic. And so this is actually a good place to start. Uh, and by the way, I wanted to just kind of, um, I thought I saw this in here. Uh, 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 I'll find it on Wednesday. I was just going to refer to uh, some of the reasons why it's not considered peer review. It's kind of like it's kind of like a news magazine. It's not published research. It's people doing research that will be published. And so, any more questions? It's time to go. So you guys on Wednesday. So tell Grace and Mr. Okay, good. I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. 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 Oh, See, but I got a number of people here that I've gotten letters. From. Yeah. So yeah, follow up on. It. Okay. And get it to. You? And they all probably. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I probably just need to send Okay. Yeah. 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 You can send them if when you get them, and a lot of times they just send it. One of your students will go. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. Good. Take yeah. care of that. Okay. And let that follow you around the whole time you're in school. Yeah, I will. I think yeah. you bet. Oh, I was just wondering, is there anything I can make up from last week? Um, let me. Uh, oh, I, I want to stop this recording and I'll show you. Let's see. Stop recording.